Hello everyone and welcome back to Global Connection and Wellbeing Online's live webinar segments. Uh, today we're going to be going through training for a 5K, 10K and beyond. But before we get into that, I wanted to uh, make a plug for a couple of events that we have coming up that we'd love to see all you at. So remember that we have uh, Rendezvous at the Point Defiant Zoo this year on August 13th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We do have a free catered lunch there for you all and that will start from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Usually at the Rendezvous events, we have live animal encounters. So bring the young ones along. They'll usually get to play with something like an armadillo, an owl, a snake, or anything like that will be available. So we hope to see you there. Uh, Wellbeing Online and Global Connections will have a table there. I'm going to be giving away bands and foam rollers and all kinds of things. We'll be discussing our Cyber, Coo our Cyber Fitness Club program, which is a gym reimbursement program. And I'm sure Global Connections will have stuff there as well. Uh, another thing that we have coming on in the summer uh, is our virtual 5K, which is really the reason for this webinar. And that's going to be running from August 12th to August 20th, where you will log your minutes for whatever uh, or however you did your 5K. With that said, we kind of have a special, uh, a, a, something special for you all today. I'm not going to be presenting this webinar. If you look at me, I think you can tell that I'm not much of a long distance runner. So generously, uh, Dr. Dion Dina Miachevic from the kinesiology program here at WSU has uh, generously given us her time to talk about some of the things that she has expertise in. She ran track at Idaho State. She was a mid-distance runner, correct? And uh, she has her PhD in sports science and has just a wide array of a lot of education that really is superior to mine. So with that said, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Dina and uh, we'll get going. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for being here, for signing up for the webinar. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background to uh, some of the things we're gonna cover today in the webinar. Um, so if you can um, turn on and uh, look at your ha uh, handouts. I gave you some of the samples if you're a novice runner, somebody who's interested in maybe participating in 5K type of events, maybe going beyond that, 10K, maybe even 12K for the Bloomsday. So you have a, kind of a representation of about eight weeks. Uh, week to week, you can actually see what are you gonna be doing each day. Um, you're going to have some rest, you're going to have some walking, you're going to have some shorter maybe logging about 1.5 miles, you're going to do up to 3 miles, so eventually like 5k is 3.1 miles along, so you're going to have some type of resistance training exercises incorporated into your program as well. But mostly you're going to gear it towards your schedule, how it works out. The sample and the examples just give you a starting point. So you have something to start with and something to kind of focus on and see what you can do and how you can go about it as well. So before we can do that, um, we need to kind of address what are the things that we can track our intensity. Um, so most of us do own uh, some type of watch. A uh, polar watch would actually be tracking your heart rate. If you have an Apple watch, iWatch, it will be tracking your heart rate as well too. But some of the formulas that we can gear towards increasing our intensity through our training, especially if we decide to go a little bit beyond 5K and really focus on improving our running performance and participating in many more races down the road as well too. There's numerous formulas that are out there and your handout actually describes all of them. So you can just find the one that you probably fits who you are. If you're somebody who is sedentary and wants to actually uh, just start the program, has never been running, never done anything even close to running, um, there's a formula for that, sedentary individuals, there's a fit individuals who already has been running or maybe having some type of aerobic endurance programs incorporated into their um, lifestyle in general as well. There's also formula based on the gender, ma males and females, that you can see at your outline too. Um, I selected just two of them. Um, target heart rate calculations based on a Carvonian method and also based on the 180 system, which is designed by Dr. Phil uh, Mephitone. It's mostly designed for runners as well. So it really doesn't, um, ba doesn't actually base it on uh, males and females, but it does base them based on like how active you are. Also, your maybe your age. So if you are like 60 plus, then maybe you need to add five. Um, if you are actually younger than that, maybe you add five based on your training levels, how often you actually work out in the frequency. So how many times per week you are 
uh, physically active, so you account for that. So your handout does describe all of that. But I use the Carvonian method um, calculating your heart at, uh, target heart rate cal calculation. So you can see in what uh, exercise intensity you want to be training at as well. So I use the formula to show you based on my age. So I'm 33 years old. So age predicted um, maximal high rate will be 220 minus my age, which is uh, 33. So ma my max high rate based on like the age predicted formula is 187 beats per minute. So I decided to actually go and work out at the um, exercise intensity 70 to 85 percent of my target high rate as well. So I uh, gave you some of the con calculations based on the range. So if I uh, calculated everything and I know my resting high rate is 52 beats per minute, that's the first thing you take up, uh, as soon as you wake up so you know actually what your resting high rate is. You should know if you wanted to use this formula. So you're going to find your heart rate reserve. So when I plug in the number and play with it a little bit um, and find my uh, uh, heart rate reserve, it's 135 beats per minute, right? So I decided that I wanted to actually work at the intensity of 70% to 85% of my uh, target heart rate. And the reason I actually did that is because I wanted to show you different types of aerobic endurance programs that you can incorporate into your running routine, especially if you decide to go more actually advanced level and really dedicate your time um, to enhance your performance, to drop your time that it takes you to complete 5K, maybe even 10K, maybe uh, 12K, which is typical Bloomsday if you live in this area where people like to participate in uh, first week uh, of May every year. But also even beyond that, if um, in you're interested in participating in a half marathon, even a full marathon as well. So the reason I did like 70 to 85% of my exercise intensity because it gives you representation of different types of aerobic endurance training programs that you can incorporate into your, uh, uh, throughout the week in your training, uh, training design plan as well too. So if I were going to use the 180 system and not, not even use the Carvonian method, I'm just going to take 180 minus my age and that would be my 147 beats per minute. So there would actually be no change. So I'm not going to be subtracting or ad adding anything because I'm actually uh, five to six times per week I'm physically active. So I do some type of activities. Um, so based on that, my high rate would not actually be changed at all. 147 beats per minute too. So uh, depending what type of method you like to use and fits your needs and who you are as an individual, how many times per week do you exercise, what type of training status you currently have, what type of other programs you have in your daily lifestyle as well, you can find the ways to uh, calculate your target heart rate. Obviously you have to have either a polar watch, a Garmin that actually accounts for your um, heart rate and um, tracks your miles if that's the interest that you have if you wanted to spend a little bit of more money to dedicate your time into your increasing your performance for running but if you wanted to just keep it basic um, regular polar watches would just do fine and you don't have to spend a lot of money on it as well but maybe you are one of those people that just wants to kind of start running kind of have a healthy and fit life and kind of uh, see what else is out there and not worry about uh, tracking your heart rate which is completely fine you can start from the basic and maybe if you really kind of take on liking running and competing in some type of 5k races even though if they're just for fun maybe a good option to dedicate some time and invest some time into finding the product that works for you in terms of watches as well i normally use just an eye watch uh, but um, I use it for mostly for cycling and I can just kind of go into my um, activity app on my iPhone and just kind of put cycling mode, but you can do that with running as well or walking if you're just starting too. Uh, with that being said guys, I want to show you some of the uh, types of aerobic um, exercises as well, types of aerobic uh, component that you can include into your uh, workouts so if, when you get better and if you wanted to actually focus more on increasing your performance. So there's five different types of aerobic endurance that you can incorporate into running as well. The first one is LSD. It stands for long, short, 
uh, short duration or long slow distance type of running too. So um, it's supposed to last about 30 to 120 minutes and you're supposed to have it about one to two times per week as well. So um, your heart rate intensity is going to be about 70% too. So you're going to be able to carry on a conversation, you're going to go your own kind of pace, you're going to um, maybe like sh um, check at the time, maybe not even count the miles or kilometers, whatever units you want to use as well. You're just going to go for about 30 minutes up to 120 minutes. So that's a pretty good way to start. So it's always um, easier to increase the duration than actually to increase the intensity, especially when you're starting the program. So that would be probably the safer option. If you're interested in more increasing your performance down the road, then overusing and always doing uh, long, slow distance type of training, it will probably impact the performance and you will not be at the level that you want to be as well. Another option, there's pace and tempo. Also about one to two times per week, but you're going to actually be at the lactate threshold as well. So it, what that means that intensity is going to be a little bit higher. So the best way to do the pace tempo, um, if you're really serious about it, so you can select what the pace you want to keep. Do you want to run in a seven, um, seven miles per hour? So you can set up the treadmill. Um, so it tracks about seven miles per hour. You can do about 20 to 30 minutes of continuous pace as well too. Or um, just for the basic purposes, you can go outside on a trail, on the road, and actually select the pace that you're comfortable at and just keep going for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, okay? These are more kind of for intermediate and advanced type of runners as well. If you're starting just from the beginning and you have no experience with running, you've never done anything similar at all, uh, that will probably be a bit more intermediate and advanced uh, type of training as well. So be careful about when you're introducing and if you're ready for pace and tempo running as well. So like I have said, normally about one to two times per week, that's when you're including pace tempo runs. And you want to spread it throughout the week so you get proper amount of time to recover, um, hydrate, get all your nutritional intake um, and get ready for the next one. So there should be some type of breaks about 48 hours between the sessions. They're focusing on pace and tempo. Interval training, guys, it's a, a, a little bit harder and it also goes above lactate threshold as well, but it has one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. And it's usually about three to five minutes long too. So you're gonna, your work is gonna be equal to your rest. So if you're uh, doing 30 seconds of work, you're gonna be resting for 30 seconds as well too. But you can do that up to three to five minutes too. So it really kind of uh, trains you to actually increase the performance, um, maybe even that final kick towards the end of your race. So if you needed to be your opponent or bridge a gap between the opponents as well. Um, another option is high intensity and interval training. The work to rest ratio is about one to five. So your uh, rest ratio is going to be five times longer than your work ratio too. So you're going to spend about 30 to 90 seconds doing these type of high intensity interval training. And it's usually once per week. So you want to dedicate the time when you have just in the middle of the week, depending how it works for your schedule. So the sample that I gave it to you can be completely changed based on how your schedule works out. So it doesn't have to follow exactly what I put on each day too. So you can gear it towards how it works for you as well too. So high intensity interval training guys, it's always for intermediate or advanced athletes. Somebody who is beginning, it's probably not a good idea. So they need to establish the baseline of training and conditioning. They need to, uh, they, you have to get used to uh, to the extent and the amount of training that your body can handle before you can move to anything that it's higher intensity, especially when it comes to running too. Um, and the last option you have is fartlek. So fartlek actually combines whole, all of these together. And it's actually the one that was, um, they broke the four minute and mile too. So the fartlek training was utilized uh, by Sir Roger Bannister too. To train, so really, what it does, it, it incorporates a lot of the flat, uh, long, slow distance type of running, a lot of the hill sprints. There is a little bit of high intensity, so you can spend about 20 to 60 minutes combining a whole bunch of different 
types together in one as well. Also about one times per week too. So that kind of gives you a little bit of uh, different variations and variety. So it's definitely above the lactate threshold, but it can vary based on what you're doing. So it can be like maybe a 70% of your intensity as well. It can be um, a little bit in the middle, just depending how you gear it towards. So you can go sprints, you can go splats, you can do hills, um, incorporating longer strides. Obviously that's gonna be a bit more advanced as well. As a beginner, you're probably going to focus just on long, slow distance type of training. So you're going to really kind of work on how you're feeling and uh, what you can kind of add along the ways. So if you look at my example, guys, so this is based on like a seven weeks type of schedule. And what do you do? You normally want to have at least one rest day in your workout um, workout routine when it comes to running and that day can be actually an active rest you can do something like yoga pilates you can do some type of stability and mobility workouts if you wanted to but make sure it's resting so you're doing something completely different from running you're changing the mode of exercising or you can take a complete complete rest and just recover and get ready for the next one on monday you're going to actually do a 10 repetition, 0.5 kilometers, um, and you're going to do intervals at race pace too. So uh, keep in mind that whatever intervals are one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. So if you're going to choose the pace you're going to follow that you're comfortable with, so keep in mind that your work ratio has to equal your rest ratio. So if you're spending 30 seconds doing the work, you're actually taking 30 seconds to rest as well too. But ke also keep in mind that you're going to have 0.5 kilometers for uh, 10 repetitions as well. This is a more kind of example um, for a little bit advanced and incorporates a whole bunch of different aerobic endurance types as well. On Tuesday, you're going to go on an easy 10 kilometer run as well. That also goes into more like beyond. So what can you do with all the information that you have, especially if you really like and take on to running and you want to enhance your performance. So you go on 10 kilometer easy run. Um, on your sample for uh, beginners, intermediate, and advanced uh, 5K runners. Um, I gave you an example that you can incorporate, but especially on the days when you have easy runs. Doesn't matter how long they are, because it's a 5K, it's usually gonna be a little bit shorter than that 10 kilometers that I listed here. But those, those could be the days that you can do some type of strengthening and stretching, right? So you can work on stability and mobility, you can do some resistant training exercises as well, but those can be incorporated based on how it works for your schedule too. On a Wednesday, you're gonna have a 45 minute long uh, slow distance type of run too so you're just gonna go for 45 minutes for a lot of the individuals it's people are different so some of us prefer just to like watch the time and not worry about the miles or kilometers some of us actually like to base our workouts on kilometers and miles and that's just the preference too so if it's easier for people to just track their time that's completely fine if it's easier to actually track the kilometers or miles or distance in general that's always an option as well uh, on Thursday there's actually five repetitions because this individual came from the rest so normally your hardest workouts guys want to want to follow right after your rest days because they you recovered you rested hopefully hydrated hopefully like nutritionally um, recovered as well too. So always your hardest workout should be right after your rest as well. So if everything else kind of seems to work out, but obviously if we're busy, we have work and school, that may need to be adjusted and that's completely fine too. Uh, so on Thursdays, you're only doing five repetitions of one kilometers, also one to one work to rest ratio. So whatever the pace that you want to select uh, could also work for um, a lot of different individuals as well. And then Friday is another 45 minute long slow distance type of run too. So um, it can just be 45 minutes. Uh, we can select maybe flat, maybe some rolling hills as well. If you're doing a lot of your training on a treadmill, it's important to um, actually select the um, incline about 1.5 because it really kind of mimics closely to how 
will be running outside, so it's not, at not, not every single road is completely flat. If you're running here in Pullman, you have to account for a lot of the hills too. So Rich actually shifts like your training method as well. So the surfaces are also extremely important when you train. So if you do a lot of your training indoors and if you like to utilize the treadmill, or you like to utilize the indoor track, I really do suggest that you alternate surfaces just for the in injury prevention and rehabilitation process as well and recovery in general. Alternate surfaces as much as you can if your time permits, permits and your schedule permits as well too. If you run indoor using the indoor track, make sure that you really are mindful about like the ways and directions the lanes are facing because um, there is a reason for it, so you don't always want to actually lean to the corners on one same side each time too, just to prevent a lot of the overuse injuries that we're going to address later when it comes to running as well too. But this kind of gives you an example of what you can do with different types of aerobic endurance uh, training programs too. Um, definitely, once you get more advanced and you want to actually follow and watch your form, it goes in more details, it's more complicated, and um, it's a little bit more advanced for um, what you can take home and what you can go from there as well, too. But if you wanted to utilize this type of approach and really kind of see what you can do with it, too. Um, on the sample schedule I gave it to you, there is a strength and stretching component of your running too. So uh, especially if we're worrying about the performance, but also if we are considering maybe preventing a lot of the uh, musculoskeletal injuries that do happen with runners very often too. It's usually due to anatomical structure, maybe some of the uh, biomechanical issues, maybe like compensating because we really don't understand the movement as well. So those areas definitely need to be recovered and strengthened too. So your running program should also come with the resistant training program too. So you don't have to make things very complicated. You don't have to stress about how am I going to dedicate this much time to running plus incorporating some type of resistance training program. It's very simple and I hope I can make it a little bit easier for you um, to actually go through these type of exercises in your own routine too. So depending what type of facilities you have, uh, what type of equipment you have, you can do a lot of the things for um, running, especially resistant training program design, you can do a lot of it with body weights. You can do, uh, utilize some of the things that you have at home. If you do have uh, the equipment and if you do have the facility that you can actually have an access to, then there's a way to utilize a lot of different equipment to actually create your workout program too. So we're mostly going to be focusing on muscular endurance too. Um, and usually for like the circa type of training, you're going to select about three to four exercises. As a runner, um, usually what they suggest, the literature suggests at least two times per week. And um, it's kind of um, hit and miss. So we know the benefits about resistant training program for injury prevention in terms of increasing your um, running type of uh, movement as well. But at the same time, um, the research doesn't support increasing the performance and resistant training for runners or endurance athletes. So a lot of the research doesn't support if you do resistant training, you're ultimately going to increase your aerobic endurance for running as well and running performance too. What you do, you prevent a lot of the overuse injuries, you strengthen the areas that need to be strengthened when it comes to running as well too. And it gives you a different way to train and have different types of uh, resources and um, examples to use when you design your own programs too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you like uh, warm up it extremely ex is important when you get into actually performing a lot of your running too. So don't skip it please. Don't skip your warm up and please don't skip your cool down too. So if I were going to show you some of the basic warm up too. So the first thing we're going to do, it takes you about 10 minutes. So this entire thing is going to actually take you about 40 minutes to complete. Generally, if you have two times per week, you, uh, usually on the days when you're doing your easy runs too, you can incorporate about 45 to 45 minutes of some type of resistant training program too. Uh, warm up first. So we're going to do a lot of the foam rolling too. So we're going to do self myofascial release. I'm going to demonstrate a lot of the, some of the exercises that you can do on a foam roller. 
Um, and also the focus is when you're doing a lot of the things, you want to focus on your uh, lower body extremities too, but also you want to focus on, because a lot of times what we do, when we're actually slouch forward to when we run. So we want to open the chest, we want to actually uh, focus on releasing a lot of the tension that it's built up in your, uh, in your upper body too as well. So you can start from actually rolling your IT bands, um, you can start rolling your hamstrings, you can start ro uh, rolling your glutes too, uh, hip flexors, so you want to actually do a lot of uh, maybe calves uh, too um, when you warm up. So you don't have to spend a lot of the times doing that. About 10 minutes is just uh, efficient enough too. Um, I like to start by actually, um, I go from like bottom to top, honestly. It's just easier for me, it works. But I actually uh, roll my anterior tibs too. You can do both legs at the same time. You can do one at a time. Um, and you don't have to put that much pressure on. See what is comfortable too. If you're a little bit on a tighter side as well. So you may have to do a little bit more too, but see what works for you. So hopefully, foam rollers are actually pretty inexpensive. A lot of people, a lot of runners have them at home too. Um, but if your facility has a foam roller, that's a, a perfect way, if, especially if you're gonna do a lot of the indoor type of workouts to start your uh, warm up too. You can move down oh, up to your quads too. Um, so you can roll, see what, about 30 seconds if you can as well. Uh, bend the knee, angle it to the side, external rotation, get a little bit of your hip flexors too. Um, and obviously you want to balance your sides as much as you can. Then you can turn into your IT band syndromes uh, or IT band, iliotibial band too. Uh, one of the most common injuries is actually an IT band syndrome too, which it's due to really weak abductors, but also overuse using like the same type of surface and leaning to the corners and going like the same way each time. That's extremely important to address. Um, you can transition into your glutes, your posterior chain, go into your um, hamstring, so it's really easy. See what actually, a lot of these exercises are very much available online. Um, a lot of different literature has, a lot of the foam rolling as well, so it's extremely to kind of pay attention to what it's useful for running as well. When I was in college, I rarely ever did any foam rolling or any myofascial releases. So I barely ever stretched, so my mobility and my flexibility is uh, pretty, limited too, but that's due to a lot of the mistakes I made as a runner and when I trained too. Um, I do like to stretch my lower back erector spinae as well. A lot of people don't, but for me, I have a herniated disc, so um, it's important I loosen up those muscles too. So um, how much time you want to spend, it's totally up to you, but no more than 10 minutes is just plenty enough too. I like to also roll my lats too. Um, also, I'm going to roll my pecs as well. So that's actually up to you. One of the most important things that you actually do focus on lower extremity and you do roll and release a lot of your pecs to a lot of your lats because of the position, how we are uh, when we actually run too. So um, a lot of these exercises are pretty, pretty useful um, and extremely important when you incorporate it into your um, warm up too. So from there, you want to go into this um, stability and mobility exercises too. So what I like to start with, um, I really like to do cat and cows. So I do about 15 seconds too. So you can go into, um, so you're going to actually have your knees bent, uh, shoulder slightly over your wrists, about a uh, shoulder width distance as well, back nice and long, head on your spine too. So you're going to actually stabilize your core and go into a cat here. I hold it about 15 seconds, and then I go into a cow, and I hold, hold it about 15 seconds too, as well. So uh, definitely another thing to really kind of uh, focus on the stability and mobility too when it comes to running. Um, I like to do a bird dog too, so alternating your right, um, so right arm, left leg, I'm gonna mirror you here. So really, really squeezing your core, engaging your core, alternate right here. 
Um, so you can go a bit wider if needed on your knees just to be more stable. Two, also making sure your foot is flexed. So toes are actually pointed down towards the ground. Dorsiflex, because dorsiflexion is one of the most important things that you need to focus when it comes to running too. So you can go into bird dogs, you hold it into 15 seconds one side, 15 seconds opposite leg, opposite arm the other side too, squeezing your glutes, squeezing your abdominals, okay, holding for about 15 seconds. You can do 15 seconds on one side, 15 seconds on the other, and do one more time. So twice is just as efficient as well too. Um, another thing you're going to do, you're going to lay on your, you're going to go prone, lay on your stomach. You're also going to alternate, so opposite leg, opposite arm too. So lift your right arm, left leg, squeeze, squeeze your glutes, hold it for 15 seconds, release, and switch two. Okay. So you can do twice on each side, alternating. It gives you a good warm-up routine so you can get ready for uh, when you go into running or if you go into your resistance exercises or maybe you're coming back from your easy run as well too. Um, another important thing, it's a glute bridge too. So this, uh, this, these exercises that we're using are extremely important for stability and mobility when it comes to running too. So lay on your back, bend your knees, extend your arms next to your side, squeeze your glutes, lift your hips here. Hold it for about 30 seconds, two, so, and then release down. Um, another thing you can do is you can actually bring the knees in towards your chest. It really stretches your lower back, really stretches your, um, in, when it comes to actually a lot of the impact activities too, release after holding it for 30 seconds, and then alternate, get one knee in, for 15 seconds and then the other knee in for 15 seconds too, okay? And then another one, you're going to finish it off, arms over your head, bend the left knee, take it to the side, stretch it, release, and switch. So that should be just a brief like warm-up type of uh, stability and mobility exercises before, uh, after, and then after that, you want to move into your dynamic flexibility as well too. So dynamic flexibility gives you an opportunity to actually work on your um, running form too. So you can do marching, you can uh, select the length that you want to take. So if it's like a cord, or if it's outside, you can just do marching opposite arm or opposite leg. So um, bending your knees, really focusing on dorsiflexion, toes pointed towards your shins too. So alternating. Once you get better, you can pick it up. A lot of like distance runners, uh, mid-distance runners generally don't do a lot of dynamic flexibility as well. Um, I've done it through my, my entire career, so it helps actually with dorsiflexion and really planting the foot right underneath the center of gravity as well too. So that actually helps you out uh, work on your running form too, but also it gives you an opportunity to watch how your arms are too, because they need to be bent in a 90 degree angle. So your hands are slowly going to brush where your pocket is. So, and uh, hands are going to be, uh, fingers are going to be loosely cupped. So you want to save on the running economy, especially for the mid distance and longer distances as well. So you're not going to see a powerful a range of motion and movement in your shoulders and your upper extremity as well. So they're going to be just kind of tracking, but you always want to watch on the form as well too. But these type of dynamic flexibility gives you, uh, they give you an opportunity to really wa wa work on the running form in general as well too. Another thing that you can do, um, you can focus on like lunging. So you can uh, select the distance that you want to cover. So let's say, what, 50 meters, and you're just going to lunge, right? So really kind of like, because lunging is one of the best exercises that transfers well to running too. And they're a part of like resistant training program too. So you can do a lot of different, you can do um, side lunge if you wanted to. Um, you can do back lunge as well too um, and that's how that actually gives you 
uh, the type of movement that it's very similar to running too. Um, also another important thing to do is actually hip openers too. So I like to open my hips because I do have a torn hip labor on my right side too. So opening the hips too, but you can actually open the hips and then lunge to the side. You can put them all together if you wanted to open the hips, lunge to the side, really sit into your heels too um, as well. So that's one of the things that you can do with lunging. You can do a whole bunch of different types, so like back lunge, forward lunge, side lunge, too. You can take it to the diagonal side. I'll show you this way, a little bit on diagonal way, too, and alternate it between the sides, so well, fat lunge matrix. But it's important to incorporate some type of lunging, even if it's just a part of your warm-up as a dynamic flexibility, too. So, once you've done with your warm up, it really doesn't, I kind of broke it down a little bit, it really doesn't take that long. It's really fast to do, uh, about 10 minutes, and then that's all you really need to do before you go into your training. Then with resistance training, your handout gives you a whole bunch of different exercises. Some of the ones that are very much applicable to um, endurance athletes in general. Think about spending about 15 to 20 minutes. You can select about three to four exercises. You don't have to do more. If you have more time throughout the week, about three, three times per week to resist and train, that's awesome. But normally we don't. So if we have at least two times per week, because you have to log the miles or kilometers into your training plan too. So if you have at least two days a week to do resist and training, that would be very, very beneficial for your optimal performance and for overall prevention of injuries too. And of strengthening your body in general too. So um, I, I will show you about three to four exercises. So I'm gonna use the suspension training, but most of us don't have the suspension training at all. So um, I'll give you some of the alternatives if you don't have the TRX, but if you do have the facility that uses them, that's completely fine. Uh, too, that's awesome. And I'll try to show you like a lot of the things, modifications that you can do on your own if you don't have the necessary equipment as well too. So you can do an overhead squat. So I'm just using the PVC pipe too. So I'm gonna uh, grab it about shoulder width distance too. I'm gonna take it over my head with arms completely straight. I like to turn my hips, uh, my toes slightly out because of um, it's a bit easier on my hips, but some people like to keep the feet straight. So I go a little bit wider too. Um, and I know like for running as well, so it's important to actually strengthen the adductors and abductors as well. So if you wanna go wider, that's completely fine. But I'm just gonna turn my toes slightly out. So I'm gonna actually keep uh, the PVC, PVC pipe over my head and bring it back down into a squat. So the important thing about it is um, it's uh, knees are over the ankles as well. I mean, I can do my ankle mobility is okay, so I can go squat a little bit deeper as well. So you really, a uh, quality of the squat is a more important than actually the quantity. But but every resistance exercise that you do, um, you probably want to do about 12 to 15 repetitions. But you can go slow. There's no reason why you need to like rush through completing your exercises as well too. So you can take your time making sure you're getting the form. If you're not sure about it, um, it would be beneficial to find somebody who can watch you, who has the experience, if you have those benefits. If you don't, you're gonna have to try as hard as you can to get the form right. I mean, it takes a couple of times and it takes practice, obviously. But that's one thing that you can do. So you can, if you wanted to do the repetitions, about 10 to 15, if you wanted to just kind of check the time, so you're focusing about 30 to 60 seconds completing your exercises too. Um, and then you uh, transition to a new one, right? So uh, one of the good things is because lunging really transfers well to running as well. So um, I'm using the chair, but you can use the plyo box, you can use the bench, anything that you have handy too. Um, and you can alternate the legs. So I'm gonna actually lunge. Again, make sure you're Knees over your ankle, back nice and long. So for balance, you can position your hands on your hip bones right here. You can challenge your balance if you wanted to with arms over your head, so you, and then you alternate as well. Obviously, you're gonna see one side is a bit stronger than the other. My left is a bit stronger than my right. So you'll see a lot of like 
different issues that I do have one side too, but it's okay, balance them as much as you want. If you do have suspension training, that adds a little bit more on like balancing type of work as well. So um, it's a good way to add something new if you do have it. So it will be, if you don't, that's completely fine, but I'll just, because we have time, I can show it to you, kind of how it's supposed to look like. In terms of the balancing lunges. And I like to mimic the, because I can really work on my running form here, so I can just actually watch my arms too, and then switch the sides as well. Okay, so another thing that you can do for the upper body here on the suspension training TRX, um, you can do the rows. So mid rows, holding onto the handles guys. So if you want to make it a bit harder, you can go come all the way closer to the anchor point. So your anchor point is going to be actually where your TRX or suspension training is hanging to. Bring those elbows in towards your rib cage, squeeze your shoulder blades, and release too. Really engaging your core here, which is what you want to see when you do a lot of all of your resistance exercises as well. Again, extremely important for running. You can do a high row if you wanted to, here as another variation. Um, I don't focus a lot about uh, resistance training for um, runners on like really doing like single joint exercises like biceps, tricep, and a lot of isolation as well. It's completely unneeded because they're worked as secondary muscle groups in a lot of the exercises that we do in terms of resistance training. Another thing about it is trunk stability and strengthening your trunk in general too. So you can start with the basic planks if you wanted to. You can go into a side plank or you can do some type of rotational movements with a medicine ball. So if you're gonna go just based on the basic thing and I'll show you things easier, harder to modify. So basic plank guys, elbows down, we're on our forearms, knees are bent, back nice and long, head on your spine, Squeeze your abs, hold here. So hold for about 30 seconds and then release too. If you want to be a little bit more advanced too, you can lift your knees. So it gets a bit more advanced as well. If you want to go a little bit more advanced, you can come up on all fours here. So shoulders over wrists, back nice and long, head on your spine. You can do a little bit of balance by lifting your one leg, then the opposite. So you can alternate for about 12 times as well. If you want it to be here, but you want to modify, you can drop the knees down, okay, and hold as well. Another exercise that you can do, you can grab a, a, a medicine ball, or you can actually grab any type of equipment at your home, like milk jug, something that, <laughs> we're trying to be creative a little bit, something that has a little bit of additional weight if you wanted to. This one is six pounds. So obviously you don't have to go this heavy or you can go heavier, but again, quality is way more important than quantity when, we, when it comes to resistant training exercises. So you wanna get the form. So I'm gonna lunge forward, right? So knee over our ankle. So um, I'm gonna take it, so if I'm gonna mirror you, this is my left leg forward right? We'll reach to the right and across your body over the opposite shorter, shoulder here. Move it down towards your, this would be your right leg and switch. Okay. And you do, I do 10 on each side and switch. Uh, my handout has a little bit of more exercises available for you too. So you can kind of choose the ones that you want to do. Um, the order of exercises, if we're doing just for general health and fitness, it really doesn't matter. But if we're doing the, like a lot of the performance things, 
then we will put like power, if you're doing a lot of the plyometric type of resistance exercises, power will come first, then you go into core exercises in terms of like back squats, um, lunges, and then you go into your assistance exercises as well. For general health and fitness, um, it won't matter as much as long as you have at least something for 5K running too. So kind of important to consider as a part of your everyday type of think about it. I know sometimes it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I don't know what to start for, with or where to, do I start from. So how do I go about it? Um, just anything that you can pretty much do in terms of like uh, lower body, lunging, squatting would be awesome. If you can do like even um, RDL as well, Romanian deadlift too. Um, since I do have a herniated disc, guys, I, don't, I do a lot of like RDLs, but I actually do it just with my body weight too. Um, and I really try to engage my glutes so I don't really um, kind of load my spine and, de and compress my lumbar spine as much too. So about hip width distance here, uh, shoulder width distance, grabbing the bar as well. Track, sit into your, squeeze the glutes, sit into your hinge right here and lift up too. That's another one that you can do. You can do a combination RDL to high pull. Um, there's a lot of different variations that you can um, do when it comes to resistant training and running too. But as long as you keep, if you hit like um, trunk stability, if you do a lot of like the mobility type of uh, lunging matrix and keep it very simple, do like a lot of the body weight exercises, you're pretty much fine too. Uh, so you don't have to spend a lot of time and like being, uh, and be stressed about how you're gonna go about your programs as well too. Towards the end, please cool down. So if you're completing your resistance training program, guys, if you're completing your like easy run, even if you're completing any of these type of uh, aerobic endurance programs that I went through, please don't skip your cool down. S do some type of stra static stretching and do foam roll again. So really focus again on calves, on hamstrings, on glutes. Um, do focus on actually releasing your lats, uh, stretching your pecs as well, rolling your pecs too, because you want to actually open your chest, open up your chest, especially after a long, uh, long run. So please, please don't skip your static stretching. You can do basic uh, quad stretch as well. If that doesn't, if it's actually hurting your knee, just grab a chair. Um, you can do a chair quad stretch too, so you don't have to actually um, Grab your ankle, push your hips forward, squeeze the glutes. There's a variation on the chair that you can do too. Uh, please stretch your hamstrings so you can lay down on your back too. Um, you can lift your leg. If you have some type of bend that you can wrap around your foot, that's completely fine. I like to try to extend, but since my hamstrings are too tight, my knee is always going to be slightly bent as well. So you can uh, hold it for about... Uh, 30 seconds, again, make sure your foot is activated, toes pointed towards your shins. Hold it here, 30 seconds, and then release as well, and switch. So please stretch your hamstring uh, for the glute stretch. You can do, actually, um, if a pigeon is too challenging, you can do an easier variation of it. So bend your knees, take your right foot, position your right ankle right uh, on your left quad to make sure you uh, flex your right ankle so toes pointed towards your shins. Lift your left left foot, grab your left actually hamstring and slowly drive that left knee in towards your chest. So you're really going to get the stretch in your glutes on your right side. If you need a little bit more sensation as well, you can gently push it against your right knee too. So you're really getting a little bit of a deeper stretch as well too. So that would be the variation if just the regular pigeon, if you're not too sure about the form, then it's normally done. Um, the other, the first one that I showed it to you on my back, it usually works a bit better for me too, but some people can really actually get that leg in at the 90 degree angle in the knee and really like sit into it so they get a really deeper stretch. I'm not there yet, like I've said, I'm not very flexible, 
So you can do that on also like a chair or a bench if you wanted to. I do this stretch a lot when I'm teaching my classes just because it's easier to just kind of use and stretch right here. Keep your back nice and long. You can just hinge from your waist and lead slowly. So you're going to feel it a little bit deeper in your glutes and your piriformis as well. And alternate sides too. Um, also, don't forget to stretch, stretch your hip flexors. I like to use the chair. So step with one foot, lean into it. Keep that knee tracking over your ankle here. Keep your back nice and long. And you're really going to get a really deep stretch in your hip flexor too because that should be another focus for running. Uh, for the calf stretch, you can use the stair or the step. So normally you can find the stairs anywhere too. Um, if you wanted to actually just keep the slight, knee, uh, bend, uh, slight bend in your knee, if you, get it, if you want to get a, your gastrocnemius and soleus, so your calves, in general, drop the heel down. If you wanted to get a little bit of Achilles tendon, that's a really good actually stretch, then uh, extend your knee here too. So don't keep the slight bend in it, but you can extend it and get a little bit more in your Achilles too, which is a one common injury when it comes to running too, okay? And switch. So you're holding about no more than 30 seconds too. So depending how tight you are, hold it up to 30 seconds if you're not as tight, Hold it up to like 15 seconds. That's completely fine too. Um, with that being said, guys, that kind of gives you general information what to look for. Warm up and cool down should be always incorporated even if you're not doing resistant training. So if you don't really have time to actually foam roll before and after doing your for, uh, warm up and a cool up, uh, do, it, uh, do it before, do it after, whatever works in your schedule too. Um, I actually like to do mine. Uh, sometimes before, sometimes after, it just depends how I feel too. Um, when I did like quite a bit of running that I didn't even utilize a lot of the foam roller rolling things because I wanted to max maximize my time that I actually spent training and doing things, but mine was mostly focused on increasing my performance in general too. Um, so please don't skip them. Um, always use the especially dynamic flexibility too with marching guys. That would be extremely important so you can work on your um, dorsiflexion and work on your form, running form. Um, your outline gives you just a sample and just brief explanation of what you're supposed to be looking for in terms of your running form. That's just as brief as I can possibly put it and describe it for you. This, I don't go into like a lot of biomechanical uh, components of what running form really should encompass too. But um, it, please read through it and kind of see how you actually are feeling about a lot of your running form and how you want to go about it and utilize it to benefit you too. Um, to conclude this presentation, guys, I want to mention like one of the the big five, those are the five most common injuries that common injuries with running and usually overuse injuries too. Patellofemoral pain syndrome as well. And usually in your knees, a lot of it, a lot of the times like runners would experience sharp pain. If you are utilizing a lot of the uh, core stability exercises, a lot of like um, abductor, adductor strength as well. You should be able to minimize a lot of those issues that are happening. If you do get injured, a lot of the times you can escape these too because the more miles you start logging, the most likely you have some of these issues arise eventually. So also keep in mind that with resistant training, you can actually alleviate some of those symptoms and you can um, prevent a lot of it from happening as well. IT band syndrome guys, another very common one, obviously due to really weak um, abductors. Um, so if you actually focus on like rolling and releasing some self myofascial release on a um, foam roller as well, but also worry about what type of surfaces, alternate the surfaces, alternate the sides if you're running indoor or even outdoor as well, reverse the way you're going all the time to minimize these issues as well too. Uh, when you do, if you ever do experience these symptoms, you probably have to stay away from it. Um, I said uh, rest a little bit too. So if they don't eventually go away, you probably would need to see a specialist, somebody who can help you out more with it too. Um, another common one is plantar fasciitis as well. So uh, one of the things, the good stretches that you can do for plantar fasciitis, it's 
just simply sit, sitting, and you can do this at work or at school, crossing your leg and hyperextending your toes, holding for about 10 seconds and releasing. Also, you can wrap the band around it and do a dorsiflexion too. Or you can go a little bit more extreme, ice a uh, water bottle, ice it, and then roll when you're sitting at your desk as well. Get that, because with plantar fasciitis, the most um, uncomfortable you're gonna be when actually after you wake up in the morning and first thing you get out of the bed, you put the pressure on your foot and you're really going to feel it as well. Um, Select, selecting the shoes will be extremely important as well, especially for people that tend to pronate um, excessively as well. So that could be fixed or minimized or accounted for with good shoe selection too. Tibial bone strains, guys, are normally due to weak dorsiflexion as well. So if you can work on like some type of exercises that um, to actually get your dorsiflexion, so pointing and flexing as well could help out too. Um, rolling, doing circles, reversing as well can also help too. But you really want to actually get the dorsiflexion to minimize tibial bone strains as well. And Achilles tendonitis too. The best thing I showed you is the stretch as well, but if it gets, tendonitis is an, is an inflammation of your tendons. Tendinosis, so if it goes into the tendinosis, it's actually scarring of your tendons as well. That means there's already, like a lot of scar tissue built up to me. You have to see a physical therapist and they have to do like transverse friction massage that they go really deep to release a lot of the scar, um, scar tissue that's been formed as well. So, but if you are uh, being careful about how you're designing your program, uh, getting plenty of rest in between, getting your resistance exercising, getting your stretching myofascial release as well with foam rolling, working on your dynamic flexibility, working on your stability and mobility as well. Uh, when it comes to running, um, you should be able to minimize any of the most common issues that are happening with running too. If you're interested in finding more about like what are the best way to incorporate a lot of the st trunk stability, uh, how to start from the basic and advance later on. I provided this actually uh, website link that it's amazing because the people that design these type of exercises are people that work with the lead runners too. But it takes you uh, step by step basing what type of exercises for uh, core stabilization you start with and how to progress more in advance. I also provided a shoe selection website. So if you're not sure what type of shoes you're supposed to be wearing when it comes to running, um, it's all gonna depend based on like your preference, but also based on like how your um, anatomically structured, you are do a pronate, do you supinate a lot? How do you run? Are you a heel striker? Do you strike with your midfoot? Do you go on your toes as well too? So that's also gonna dictate what type of shoes you're gonna select as well. Um, if you're serious about this and if you want to minimize a lot of the issues that come with logging the miles and running and training in general, you can visit a lot of the running stores will actually analyze your gait and uh, see how you're stepping to uh, give you recommendations for the proper footwear that you have as well. The website that the shoe finder website, you can base it on your gender, but also you can select uh, what type of running you do. Are you, want, are you willing to focus on road running, trail running? was a combination of both. And then you can select what features you want to have in your shoes as well. How many miles you want to log on to. Do you have any uh, injuries already in the past as well too. So that's something that it's accounted for um, when you're selecting a good shoe too. Um, it's extremely important when it comes to running. So don't ignore it, especially if you decide to pick up on running later on in your life and you get really, really serious about it. Um, so with that being said guys, here are the resources, the handout gives you an example of what you can uh, do with running and how you can start your program. Very basic, I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, if you are interested in increasing your performance, definitely you're going to have to adjust your training plan later on, but please be safe, be careful how you're starting up. Um, use the resources that you have, do the research on your own. A lot of the information that I've provided, it's based on my personal training experience uh, with scientific literature backing it up as well. But it's um, also something that has fitted my needs when I was an athlete. Um, I don't run anymore. 
Um, I tend to, I cycle a lot, uh, so I transition a little bit from running to something different. Uh, but the information is based on my own experience as well. So I hope I gave you some tools to start your own running program. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? You did excellent, Dina. Thank, thank you so you. much for sharing everything. We do have a couple questions in already, but I do want to remind everyone that's listening to, if you have any questions, please log into the chat box on the Watch Live page. Um, you can do that simply by typing in your name and hit join, and you can type in your question there. Our first question asks, I would like to run a 10K by September and or October. Right now, I run two miles each day, two days in a row. Then I rest for two days. Each week, I increase by half a mile. Do you have any training advice for 10K? Um, so it's based on how many days you want to actually train as well. So if she's doing, um, she's wanting to do like a, a race in September and October, that would be plenty of time for her to train as well. So um, I would suggest that you take, uh, based on if you also take into consideration your training status. So if she runs like two days in a row for about uh, four miles and then two days off as well. That's um, the training stimulus is taking like two days on, two days off. Uh, with running, it could be a little bit too like much of a break in between, especially with two days in a row. Uh, but I also want to make sure that I know what her training status is. So if she's an advanced runner, she would be uh, logging a little bit more miles to um, into her program as well. So she can do one day rest at least per week and then start kind of, she doesn't go up, to, she doesn't have to go up to 10 kilometers that week, but she can start maybe building up to five kilometers one week. The next week she can do six kilometers. The following week she can do seven kilometers as well. And that could be one day. The rest of the day she can break it up so she can do like what, three kilometers one day, then four kilometers the other day, and then she can take a rest and then can, she can do her longer run as well too and incorporate it easy, a little bit faster. So it just depends, it's hard, it's actually I don't give her enough recommendations because I don't know her training status. If she's somebody advanced, she can do a lot more to progress and get where she wants as well. And also I need to know, does she want to just do it for fun or she wants to just kind of really focus on increasing her performance? I think it's going to actually vary as well too. I would suggest that um, to look at the outline because it has a 12K um, type of program as well and kind of um, if she can do easily a 12k she can do a 10k too so she can just lower down some of the kilometers and follow that type of example that she has and she should be fine to do it but from right now I don't give her enough justice to give her like really recommendation because I don't know what else she does in her training too and how tr her training status is. Thank you. Our next question asks, is walking a sufficient way to warm up and cool down? <laughs> well, um, with running, just walking, probably no. If she's a beginner, yes, she can definitely, if, something, if somebody's sedentary and just incorporating walking into her warm up, yes, but eventually she wants to actually do some type of different movement patterns, maybe like easy jog, depending on what type of like running she's going to do. If she's going to do pace tempo, obviously walking is not going to work. If she's going to do like an easy run, walking is just as sufficient too. If she's going to do more intense type of like running programs for her day of training, walking is probably not going to do much as an efficient warm up as well too. 